Okay, Dr. Myers, all yours. Okay. So welcome. Uh, today's webinar is uh, called Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, What a Psychologist Needs to Know. Uh, I am Lorna Myers, uh, the director of the PNES treatment program at the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group. And although the title says what a psychologist needs to know, the objective of the webinar is, in fact, to provide a brief introduction to the PNES for all mental health professionals, including psychologists, but also psychiatrists and social workers. So a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today, beginning with an introduction to PNES. Uh, we're going to go over some definitions and facts, how it's diagnosed, and what the comorbid psychiatric conditions associated to PNES are. We'll also talk about why psychologists are so important in the treatment of patients with PNES, and what do we know about the utility of existing treatments that can be employed. We'll discuss general recommendations for psychologists or mental health professionals who are planning on treating a patient diagnosed with PNES. And at the end, uh, we'll go over some resources for professionals who are working with uh, this disorder, as well as for uh, patients that are living with this disorder. So starting out with uh, just three very basic definitions, we're going to define seizures, epilepsy, and PNES. Seizures are defined as an involuntary behavioral change, it can involve movements of body parts, alterations of consciousness, loss of certain functions, for example, speech or vision. Uh, seizures can be generalized, affecting the entire body, or partial, affecting only part of the body. And seizures can be seen in both epilepsy and in PNES. The definition of epilepsy is uh, that um, this is a diagnosis that is given to a person after they have had more than one seizure and the seizures are unprovoked, meaning that there was not a drug or alcohol uh, that was consumed that provoked that seizure. And the seizure that occurs during epilepsy is associated with an abnormal electrical activity in the brain. PNES, seizures in PNES can appear very much like an epileptic seizure, behaviorally they resemble an epileptic seizure and can be very hard to discriminate. But they do not demonstrate epileptiform activity during recording of brain waves when an EEG is being used. So a definition of PNES could be, and there are a number of them, but we can start by using this is an episodic behavioral event that resembles epileptic seizures but is not associated with abnormal epileptiform electrical discharges of the brain. PNES is associated with underlying psychological stressors, and there's often a history of psychological trauma. PNES is not a single entity, but rather a diagnosis that is given due to the symptoms of seizures, but which is associated with multiple psychiatric comorbidities. So the seizures are conceived of as symptoms of an underlying psychological condition. The reason this is underlined is because this is clearly a psychological condition, and uh, this is why we are discussing this today as mental health professionals. As per DSM-5, PNES is classified as a conversion disorder or a functional neurological symptoms disorder. Functional referring to some form of abnormal central nervous system functioning of unknown etiology. So they are now, at this time, typically called either PNES or FNSC. And this uh, definition or this uh, uh, diagnosis uh, requires a few criteria. A would be that there is one or more symptoms of altered voluntary motor or sensory functions. B, clinical findings. Symptoms are incompatible with medical or mental disorder. C, symptom of deficit is not better explained by another medical or mental disorder. And D, these symptoms are causing significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of life. 
and they are typically uh, considered S44.5, which would be uh, this uh, conversion disorder, or FNSD, with attacks or seizures. There are a number of risk factors uh, in those who have PNES. I'm going to list just a few. The one that stands out quite a bit is that there is often a history of traumatic or adverse life experiences, including significant health events, as well as physical, sexual, emotional abuse, major losses, deaths, and so forth. There's a history of psychiatric disorders that often includes depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and personality disorders. And there is often a history of medically unexplained symptoms. And yes, uh, from a historical perspective, has been around for a very long time. Uh, these seizures, psychogenic seizures, are the most common paroxysmal events that are misdiagnosed as epilepsy. They tend to fall in an intersection between neurology and psychiatry psychology, which complicates smooth transitions to treatment. PNES has been recognized historically for a long time. There have been some somewhat unusual uh, theories and explanations as to what um, is causing these seizures, including uh, some of the more colorful ones, uh, wandering uterus, um, where it is suspected that seizures might be resolved by becoming sexually active or having children, and that in some way, uh, perhaps through sexual repression, um, these seizures have come about. And there have also, uh, at times, been uh, explanations of demonic possessions. Although this is now almost completely in history, um, I have encountered patients uh, in the uh, 20th and 21st century um, who are uh, still sometimes being told by their family um, or by people who know them that um, what they're having could possibly be explained by one of these uh, theories. PNES has been around for a very long time and if any of us have uh, taken Psychology 101 courses um, and we ever read uh, anything about Charcot or Breuer or Freud, We've read about uh, hysteria and the use of hypnosis, dissociation, conversion of psychic symptoms into physical symptoms, of the famous case of Anna O, oh, and the importance of psychological trauma, which began to be understood way back then. This is the history of PNES with a lady uh, here who is, uh, um, has apparently fainted and it's being uh, examined by this group of doctors. Although this happened historically, it continues to happen. The only difference is that now uh, most of these patients are not seen um, in regular medical settings, but rather in epilepsy centers. Just a few more facts. What is the correct name for PNES? We are calling it PNES throughout this presentation, but there are some uh, terms that continue to be used and that are um, either deemed to be offensive or have been abandoned um, by uh, most health professionals, but they still linger from time to time. The current acceptable term is psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, PNES, or uh, as in England, um, non-epileptic attack disorder, NEAD, N-E-A-D. Terms that have or should be abandoned uh, and that um, tend to be uh, rejected quite vehemently by uh, patients uh, is pseudo-seizures, hysteroepilepsy, or hysteria. Uh, in particular, pseudo-seizures uh, continues to be used by a number of professionals, and um, there is a growing movement uh, that is a grassroots movement uh, that is opposed to this uh, term because it has connotations um, that uh, refer to faking or to uh, somehow uh, presenting things uh, consciously and for a secondary gain. Um, so it is recommended that if you are uh, working with these patients, um, you should not be using this term anymore, and you should be using 
a much more descriptive and accurate term of PNES or NEAT. A few more facts about PNES. PNES occurs most frequently between the ages of 20 to 40 years, but it can happen uh, that uh, someone much younger or someone older than that develops PNES for the first time. It is much more common in women with a 3 to 1 ratio. The average time that elapses between the first seizure and a definitive diagnosis is 7.2 years. Often these patients are diagnosed with epilepsy and are treated with anti-epileptic medications. Uh, these medications are unnecessary and are also not helpful. Uh, there are a number of patients who've also had experiences in emergency rooms um, where they are taken by emergency personnel. Uh, they are intubated. They are treated with medications that are not um, appropriate for PNES. Um, so this is a very worrying um, average time between first seizure and the definit definitive diagnosis of PNES. And it would be uh, really a, a very, very important goal to shorten this time. Up to 20 to 30 percent of patients evaluated on an inpatient epilepsy monitoring unit uh, may be diagnosed as having PNES. Um, so there are a large number of these patients that eventually end up in the uh, funnel of the uh, epilepsy monitoring uh, units in hospitals. Uh, estimates of PNES prevalence uh, ranges from 2 to 33 out of every 100,000 persons. Uh, this is uh, from a uh, publication that Ben Bedis and Hauser uh, put out in 2000. And approximately 5 to 10 or 10% 10, 10 are dually diagnosed with PNES and epilepsy. And those in particular, those patients who have a dual diagnosis of PNES and epilepsy are uh, very tricky uh, to diagnose and uh, require some very careful uh, examination and then um, understanding of uh, which seizures are non-epileptic and which ones are epileptic. So how is PNES diagnosed? And we're not going to talk about this too much, but this is the important first step. Uh, usually that precedes uh, the entry of the mental health professional, but is incredibly important to have uh, had uh, the diagnosis confirmed. And this is uh, how, how it is at this point uh, being confirmed. Uh, PNES can have a multitude of presentations. Uh, there can be paralysis, violent thrashing, slurred speech, uh, stuttering, blinking, odd eye movements, alteration of consciousness, etc and can very much look like an epileptic seizure. So a simple observation, visual observation of the seizure, uh, although there are some key signs that uh, neurologists and epileptologists uh, may use if they, uh, if they suspect that there is PNES, um, the gold standard for a diagnosis of uh, PNES is something called a video EEG. Uh, during which all the typical events are recorded. And uh, this says all because there could be different types of events. And you want to be sure that uh, you've captured all of the typical events and that they were all non-epileptic and that you're not dealing with someone who uh, has dual diagnosis of epilepsy and PNES. You want to be sure that during this uh, test there are no associated epileptiform discharges that are noted before, during, or after the event. And you want also to collect a history and semiology that should be consistent with PNES. So there's something called the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, and they have uh, guidelines for referrals for seizure disorders. And the uh, association states that delayed or denied referral may be detrimental to the patient's health, safety, and quality of life. The guidelines are that if seizures have not been brought under control after three months of care by a primary care provider, family physician, or pediatrician, further neurologic in the intervention by a neurologist or an epilepsy center is appropriate. So this is after three months. Uh, a general practitioner has been seeing the patient. There is no uh, improvement, 
uh, so then um, the referral is made to the next level of specialist. If seizures have not been brought under control after 12 months while being treated by a general neurologist, a referral to a specialized epilepsy center or epileptologist should be made. If these guidelines were followed, it's much more likely that we would cut down on that 7.2 years uh, average time between first seizure and uh, definitive diagnosis that we talked about earlier. And I've listed a uh, link down here uh, that is um, from the American Epilepsy Society. Uh, this is a link to find a epilepsy doctor or epilepsy center uh, based on zip codes. So this is a, a useful piece of information. If you are seeing a patient who is having uh, seizures and is not responding, um, it would not be inappropriate to uh, discuss uh, the possibility of needing a second opinion. And this would be a, a good place to start to look for um, an epilepsy specialist. So how is PNES diagnosed? We've got a picture here of what a video EEG uh, machine would be like. Uh, the patient is hooked up to an EEG um, through uh, leads on the scalp. And these leads, which I'll show you something else, the patient is hooked up in, in this way with uh, leads placed on the scalp. And then this uh, right here, which are these squiggly lines, are the brain waves that are being picked up by those leads. And this is a camera that is filming the patient while the study is, is ongoing. And this is where you would see um, what is being filmed. So the epilepsy specialist will be looking at the behavior that the patient is exhibiting, as well as the brain waves, and seeing uh, if those coincide, if those are consistent with uh, an epileptic seizure or not. A very, very complex uh, piece of machinery to be able to diagnose someone with PNES. It's only in the last uh, four or five decades that uh, this equipment has been around, um, and um, probably less than that uh, for video EEG. And um, this is what has really moved uh, the diagnosis of PNES forward in a, in a dramatic way. This is a different kind of uh, uh, machinery that is also used uh, for the diagnosis of uh, epilepsy and uh, PNES. This is called an ambulatory video EEG. So again, um, you have a, a camera that is with the patient, and uh, this uh, briefcase contains all of this, which is also the machinery for the EEG, and the leads are placed uh, in the office, and then the test goes on for several days uh, in a natural setting uh, that the patient lives in. So in addition to all of that uh, machinery and all of those tests that are being run, uh, while still an inpatient, uh, it is recommended that those patients with clinical features that are consistent with PNES should be evaluated by a mental health provider. Uh, this clinician, uh, during the interview, will determine whether there are typical risk factors, emotional triggers to seizures, significant psychiatric comorbidities, and past attempts at solutions, as well as other uh, pieces of information that might be useful. So um, the interview is uh, really very important at this time because whatever is obtained through that interview is also combined with all the other results that are being obtained while in the hospital. But if it is not possible to perform a psychological assessment during the hospital diagnostic phase, the psychological assessment should be performed as soon as possible as an outpatient. And then therapy should begin as soon as possible as well. Now, PNS is much more than seizures, although seizures are the very dramatic way in which it presents. The seizures tend to overshadow other things. But frequently, patients with PNES have one or more of the following, um, depression, anxiety, trauma, PTSD, pain syndromes, dissociative disorders, personality disorders. 
Um, so we're just going to go very quickly over uh, some of the numbers that have been reported that have been published on uh, comorbid psych conditions and PNES. Um, there are reports of unipolar or bipolar depression in anywhere from 21 to 78 percent of patients with PNES. Approximately 50% of patients with PNES also carry a diagnosis of anxiety disorder. Up to 25% are reported to have made a suicide attempt. 75 or more uh, percent of patients with PNES have a history of trauma. And depending on the study, anywhere from 22 to 100% carry a diagnosis of PTSD. Pain syndromes have been reported in anywhere from 22 to 89 percent. Dissociative disorders anywhere from 22 to 91 percent. Personality disorders anywhere from 10 to 86 percent with uh, predominantly borderline and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. They often suffer from medically unexplained symptoms. And U.S. And family characteristics in patients with PNES also tend to present uh, unique um, features. Families do tend to have more difficulty with communication, affect, and general functioning. There have been a number of studies that have looked at this. Families of origin of patients with PMS tend to have more health problems, a greater tendency to somatize, and can be more critical and distressed even than families of patients with epilepsy. And there tends to be a family psychiatric history uh, uh, that is uncovered uh, during interview. Approximately 30% of patients with PNES fulfill a criteria for alexithymia. Emotional processing is a serious issue. Many patients can be classified into one of two subgroups, undermodulators or overmodulators. Undermodulators tend to have very high emotional reactivity low tolerance to excitement, difficulty controlling emotions, poor quality of life, and considerable psychiatric comorbidities such as depression, anxiety, and borderline personality disorder. There tend to be um, issues with uh, coping with stress, um, with a tendency to uh, be more emotional or avoidant in stress management rather than task-oriented. In contrast, overmodulators tend to exhibit emotional avoidance. They're excessively controlled in their behaviors. Somatization tendencies, psychiatric comorbidities are less obvious. Um, and often the patient will present um, very much focused on the symptoms of the seizures and uh, is not as interested in speaking about uh, any stress or any issues that are psychological. Uh, now, these patients can be resistant uh, to the psychogenic diagnosis, but with clear explanations and patients, they too uh, do understand and benefit from treatment. Um, it just uh, requires a different approach. So we're going to shift over now to what treatments are available. And we're going to talk about just four different kinds of treatments, um, although my suspicion is that, uh, for the most part, um, there are so many variations in those uh, persons who are diagnosed with PNES that uh, one particular treatment um, may, may be appropriate for one person and uh, not a good match for someone else. may also depend on uh, what time uh, in, the, uh, in the life of the, of the disorder uh, we are uh, meeting the patient um, and uh, these are uh, the four treatments that we are going to be talking about are the ones that have been uh, reported and, and empirically uh, studied. Um, but there may be uh, other treatment approaches that are quite useful and that are simply not mentioned because uh, this is a very brief review of um, what has been published so far. So definitely psychotherapy is the indicated mode of treatment once the diagnosis of PNES has been made. And there is empirical validation and reports of utility of the following treatment approaches, uh, including psychodynamic therapy, mindfulness-based therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, which includes prolonged exposure uh, for dually diagnosed PNES and PTSD patients, and psychoeducational group interventions. 
I put a star next to cognitive behavioral therapy because this is the uh, modality that had been most uh, examined and is at this point uh, showing the uh, strongest results. So let's start talking about psychodynamic therapy. And anyone who's listening to this may have a preference or a particular uh, approach that they use. Um, and uh, this is only meant to be a very brief introduction, uh, a very brief description of uh, the, um, these four different treatment modalities, um, as well as uh, mentioning one or two articles that have uh, recently been published. So from the psychodynamic uh, therapy perspective, um, psychogenic symptoms are typically seen as produced by internal processes resulting from traumatic memories, often from childhood, that are maintained at an unconscious level through dissociative conversion and somatic defense mechanisms. The goal of psychodynamic therapy is to bring unconscious material to the surface to promote change through insight. There have been two uh, important studies in recent years that have looked at the effects of psychodynamic therapy on PNES. Oliveira and um, her co-authors uh, examined 37 patients who were treated with uh, weekly sessions of psychodynamic treatment for 12 months. Um, what they found was that 29.7% stopped having psychogenic seizures completely at the end of treatment. And 51.4% had had a decline in seizure frequency. But the decline was not uh, defined, so um, there's no uh, precise uh, number for what exactly this meant um, and, uh, and what percentage uh, this represented. There's also a need for follow-up data on the maintenance of these improvements. Um, that was not provided in the paper. and uh, is often not provided in, in many papers that um, have looked at uh, effectiveness of uh, therapy um, for patients with PNES. And Mayer et al. Uh, is a, um, represents a uh, particular study that did look at follow-up of patients, and it's one of the few. Um, in this paper, uh, what was described was an augmented psychodynamic interpersonal therapy of two hours semi structured initial interview, and up to 19 50-minute weekly or bi-weekly sessions. So by the end of this treatment uh, protocol, 47 of the 66 patients completed follow-up questionnaires. A total of 66 patients completed the treatment, but only 47 of 66 completed the follow-up questionnaires at a median of 42 months. Uh, and this went anywhere from 12 months to 61 months. Of those 47 patients, uh, 12, a total of 25.5%, uh, reported that they were event-free. And 19, a little bit over 40%, had experienced a greater than 50% reduction in event frequency at the follow-up period compared to baseline. These are two uh, important studies that have uh, been recently published and that uh, are supportive of uh, psychodynamic therapy as effective uh, for PNES. Mindfulness-based treatments for PNES uh, are also just recently starting to be um, uh, spoken about and, uh, and researched. Mindfulness involves being aware, moment to moment, of subjective conscious experiences. The regular practice of meditative practices improve attention and emotional regulation, as well as body awareness. All of these are key targets in a disorder such as PNES. So it makes perfect sense from a theoretical perspective that this would be a good approach to use with uh, patients with this diagnosis. Um, particularly patients uh, with PNES often present with alexithymia and uh, the difficulties that we talked about before with under or over modulation of emotions when they tend to avoid distress and thought content and so forth. So mindfulness uh, comes in uh, and really targets those uh, aspects quite beautifully. Uh, with this treatment modality, experiential avoidance, uh, avoidance is challenged while personal values are delineated, and that provides patients with healthier, consciously chosen behavioral pathways. 
that can uh, replace the seizures. And there is a uh, researcher and neuropsychiatrist, uh, Gaston Basslet, um, who is at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, who has been really spearheading research in this area. A recent article that he uh, published um, in 2014 uh, reported that of a total of six adult females who were enrolled in a 12-session mindfulness protocol, um, by session 12, all had a reduction in event frequency, and three of six had stopped having episodes completely. There were also improvements in depression and anxiety. The treatment components are um, psychoeducation and goal setting, stress management training, mindfulness training, emotion recognition, acceptance and behavioral regulation. So these are the uh, targets uh, for this particular treatment. Move on now to cognitive behavioral treatments for PNES. CBT operates on current maladaptive thoughts, behaviors, and feelings with the aim of producing healthy changes. This approach proposes that core beliefs of oneself, others, and the future can be modified through certain interventions and dysfunctional thoughts and behaviors related to conversion symptoms can be challenged and changed. The CBT is the psychotherapeutic approach that has been reported to have the highest level of efficacy evidence at this time for PNES. And there are a number of studies uh, that are uh, very good and uh, very thorough. Uh, we will just talk about uh, two of them, uh, Goldstein and all. And, et al. Um, from 2010, uh, published a randomized controlled pilot study in which a group received treatment as usual, TAU, and the other group received CBT. The treatment components were treatment engagement, initially, reinforcement of independence, distraction, relaxation, and refocusing techniques when an episode was imminent, graded exposure to avoided situations, cognitive restructuring, and relapse prevention. The CBT group experienced a significant reduction in monthly episodes. Frequency uh, for treatment as usual group uh, was at a median of 6.75 monthly episodes, while those who received CBT plus treatment as usual were experiencing two monthly events. However, at six months follow-up, the statistically significant difference was lost although improvements were maintained. Another study uh, that we'll talk about is a study by uh, Kurt LaFrance, 2014. And uh, in this study, he conducted a multi-center pilot randomized study that produced class one data. A total of 34 patients were enrolled into one of four treatment arms. Those arms were one, flexible dose, Tertulline hydrochloride only. Two, cognitive behavioral informed psychotherapy. Three, CBT informed psychotherapy with sertraline. And four, treatment as usual. Both the CBT IP alone and the CBT IP with sertraline showed the most uh, improvements. Uh, the CBT only group showed a 51.4% 0.4% uh, reduction in event frequency, and a significant improvement on several secondary measures of depression, anxiety, quality of life, and global functioning. The CDT plus sertraline uh, arm showed significant reduction of a 59.3% in monthly events, and significant improvement on secondary measures of global functioning. Now, there is a need for follow-up data on uh, maintenance of the improvement that was reported in this study. I am not aware of uh, any follow-up data that has been published at this point. And we'll just very quickly go over what the CBT IP that we were mentioning in the previous slide is about. Uh, there are a total of 12 sessions, and uh, they are described here very briefly. Session one is making the decision to begin taking control. A very important uh, issue with PNES is control, loss of control during seizures. And during this session, uh, there is a focus on 
the importance and the active decision of taking control. Second session, getting support. Third session, deciding about your drug therapy, whether it's necessary or not. Fourth session, learning to observe your triggers, which is a very important piece as well for PNES, um, becoming much more aware of what occurred before the seizure, what might have triggered it. Uh, initially, that may not be obvious to the patient, but with work and attention and by keeping a log, this is possible to achieve. Session six, I'm sorry, session five, channeling negative emotions into productive outlets. Session six, relaxation training. Session seven, identifying your pre-seizure aura, uh, simply meaning uh, what are the uh, signs physically, physical signs that the patient may have uh, prior to the full-blown seizure. It may be a headache, it may be tunnel vision, it may be heart palpitations, um, change in breathing, and so forth. Um, so, uh, working with the patient so that um, they identify uh, what this aura uh, is. Session eight, dealing with external life stresses. Session nine, dealing with internal issues and conflicts. Session 10, enhancing personal wellness, including exercise and diet and so forth. Session 11, other symptoms associated with seizures. And session 12 is taking control, an ongoing process. And for uh, a number of patients, uh, treatment can finish at this point, but there is a, another substantial number of patients who may need ongoing treatment um, or who may need uh, to have booster sessions from time to time or fine-tuning sessions from time to time. And I do often discuss this with patients that uh, we may complete a course of treatment um, and that there may still be a need uh, for uh, either continued treatment or for a return to treatment at some point in the future. I always find that it's best to uh, have, have that discussion. Um, now, another form of CBT treatment for uh, PNES is uh, specifically for those patients that have PNES and PTSD. And we said before in a previous slide that approximately, um, depending on the study, anywhere from 22% to 100% have PTSD. In my experience, it's usually lower than 100%, but typically anywhere from 25 uh, to 40 something percent uh, will uh, fulfill criteria for PTSD. Uh, so these particular patients have a dual diagnosis of two very, very um, troubling um, conditions. Um, PNES, which in itself is a very disabling condition, and PTSD. Um, prolonged exposure therapy, P, um, is a very effective treatment for the treatment of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. It was developed by Edna Foa. The core components of uh, exposure therapy are to replace the avoidance behaviors with exposure and confrontation. And it's basically made up of two different kinds of exposure, imaginal exposure, which involves revisiting the traumatic memory, repeated recounting of it aloud, and processing the experience of memory recollection. And in vivo exposure, which involves the repeated confrontation with uh, situations and objects that have been associated to the trauma and that cause the stress, but that are not inherently dangerous. CBT treatments for PNES PTSD, um, in particular prolonged exposure, acts on four different areas. Uh, the avoidance symptoms, um, it acts on it because the memory and other life aspects are not being avoided, but rather they are being confronted. It acts on intrusive symptoms because the patient learns to recollect the memory and associated thoughts voluntarily instead of being intruded on. It acts on hypervigilance because the patient learns that many of the dangerous situations are in fact safe and because intrusive symptoms come down, and it acts on negative thoughts and mood because there's a sense of achievement and regained confidence. In particular with PTSD and PNES, uh, PE, in, in my view, is not only acting on those four aspects that we talked about, negative thoughts and mood, intrusive symptoms, hypervigilance and avoidance, 
but it is also acting on the seizures, which represents an avoidance 2.0 type of mechanism. Now, in 2015, uh, there's a study uh, that um, we have just uh, presented and will be presenting at uh, the American Epilepsy Society. Um, seven adults uh, were enrolled. They were dually diagnosed with PNES and PTSD. They completed 12 to 15 weeks of PE. And the results uh, showed that there was a significant reduction of depressive symptoms, post-traumatic symptoms, and seizure frequency. Follow-up at anywhere from 2 to 27 months, depending on the patient, revealed that all patients had maintained improvements regarding seizure frequency, except for one patient who had suffered a bit of a reversal, had not gone back to where she had been initially, but um, was having an increase of seizures compared to when she uh, completed treatment. Five of these seven were either working or enrolled in school. This is a very important finding because there is such a high incidence of disability and chronicity in this patient population. And um, the fact that these patients uh, were resuming activities uh, was very important. So P with patients uh, with PNES um, in this uh, particular study was administered according to the manual with some modifications that included specifics of PNES and to address over-engagement. And the treatment components are the same as uh, one would find in the, uh, in the actual manual. Uh, the only differences are that um, the session in which common reactions to trauma are discussed includes uh, PNES as a potential common reaction as well. Uh, during the trauma interview, detailed descriptions of seizures are also obtained. Uh, seizure logs also become part of the homework. And breathing and grounding techniques can be used during the episodes themselves to recover control. Let's move on now to the fourth type of treatment that we're going to discuss today, psychoeducational groups for PNES. Way back in 2004, Zaroff et al. Uh, conducted a psychoeducational group with uh, seven patients for a duration of 10 sessions. The topics at that point uh, uh, covered education about PNES, anxiety, depression, trauma, anger, and assertiveness, healthy behaviors such as diet, sleep, and exercise, PTSD and dissociative symptoms, and emotion-based coping strategies. I'm sorry. Uh, PTSD and dissociative symptoms and emotion-based coping strategies decreased uh, at the end of these 10 sessions. This is really a uh, first attempt at uh, any type of um, uh, formal treatment um, in a group setting um, and is now uh, often cited as a, a more historical type of uh, uh, publication. Um, what was found, though, is that uh, through these 10 sessions, there was an improvement, um, like I said, in PTSD and dissociative symptoms, and there was a decrease in this emotion-based coping strategy. Um, there was also a trend towards an uh, improved quality of life. And uh, event frequency did not change significantly, although there were only seven patients and three of those six were seizure-free at outset. A much more recent uh, psychoeducational group uh, study um, is from 2014, Chen et al. Uh, compared an intervention group consisting of three monthly psychoeducational meetings and a routine seizure clinic follow-up control group, so treatment as usual. Uh, the interventions that they had, uh, that they used were uh, lectures on PNES and safety and universality of the condition. Two, how physical symptoms can arise from underlying emotional causes. And three, empowering patients to take control using distress tolerance techniques, relaxation exercises, and scheduling time for naps. I'm not quite sure why that was included, um, although I'm, I'm suspecting that's part of a uh, wellness um, intervention. Patients were prospectively followed at three and six months. And although there was no significant change in event frequency uh, or intensity, means that they were still having the same number of seizures or the same intensity of seizures, there was a significant improvement on a scale of work and social adjustment and a trend towards decreased emergency department visits or hospitalizations in the intervention group. This last um, 
fact, is a, is a very important one because um, the cost uh, of this uh, disorder is astronomical um, with emergency department visits or hospital stays um, when patients have either not been correctly diagnosed yet or uh, when the seizures are still persisting uh, even after a diagnosis. So now we're going to shift. We've been over um, definitions uh, of PNES and uh, facts about PNES and the uh, four types of treatments that um, have been um, reported and published about. Um, and now we're going to shift uh, to just some recommendations, common sense and practical recommendations for psychologists. So this is based on my experience of working with uh, patients with PNES now for over 10 years. And um, it is simply my perspective or my recommendations, uh, not to be written in stone, but they have been useful for me. And um, I expect that they might be useful for someone else who is just starting to work with uh, patients with PNES. In particular, despite the fact that there are these treatments and that there are psychologists um, who are quite competent in the administration of these treatments, um, the problem continues being that um, these seizures, uh, when they present, are very dramatic. They're very off-putting. They can be scary. They can um, just be flat out unusual. Um, and uh, we'll often either give the uh, mental health professional the sense that um, this is outside of their scope of practice or that um, the diagnosis uh, needs to be re-verified or that this is actually a neurological condition and not a psychological condition and so forth. Um, so this is why we started out talking about the importance of the diagnosis and that the diagnosis should really be made uh, by an epilepsy center, an epileptologist, um, with this uh, gold standard that we talked about with the video EEG. Uh, but when a patient does come with a diagnosis that's been confirmed uh, with one video EEG or often even more than one video EEG, um, it is important that the uh, mental health professional um, understand what that diagnosis meant, uh, how, uh, how it was confirmed, and to then work in the direction of uh, treating the psychological issues. Uh, whether there is a seizure or not in the office. So some of the uh, practical advice that I can give is that um, at the outset of the treatment, um, it's important to obtain a description of the typical seizures and what their frequency is. I'm going to want to know, does the patient have an aura? Does the patient uh, feel something in their body, either palpitations or a headache or uh, hear a sound or something that tells them before they have a full-blown seizure. So I'm going to want to know about that um, because that is something that I'm going to want them to share with me if they are having a, a particular aura. I want to know how the seizures start. What do they look like? They can look in all kinds of uh, presentations. So I want to know if someone uh, starts out by falling over or if someone uh, starts out by um, simply being quiet and uh, and being um, just uh, sort of shut down. Um, what are the characteristics? Does the patient fall? Do they vocalize? Do they thrash? Do they shake? Do they self-harm? For example, scratching or banging the head. Uh, do they move around? Do they bite? Um, do they vomit? Um, which happens rarely, but it does happen in some cases. Is hearing speech or writing retained during the episode. This is very important because if hearing is retained, this allows the uh, therapist to be able to continue speaking with the patient um, and guiding them during the episode. Uh, if writing is retained, then this will be a way of communicating even if the patient cannot speak. And I also want to know the duration. Some seizures last a minute, some seizures last hours. So I'm going to want to know what we're walking into. Is there something that the patient finds helpful during the episode? Um, for example, uh, is it helpful to be able to focus in on something? 
or to uh, hear someone speaking to them? And how long until the patient fully recovers? Um, fully recovers means that they can um, actually go home. I'm always also going to make sure right at the beginning that I have an understanding with the patient that I or you, the therapist, will be uh, perhaps touching them during the episode. So you're going to come to an agreement as to what part of the body is safe to touch and if there is a part of the body that cannot be touched. So for example, if the patient was perhaps bound by the wrist during the uh, traumatic events that occurred, um, then wrists may be off limits. Um, is it okay to squeeze an arm or a shoulder, uh, which is usually my preferred um, place of, uh, of, of touching a patient. So just touching the arm or touching the shoulder or stroking the hand. Um, and if the patient falls, I also want to make sure that it's understood that, that I may need to hold the patient to avoid injury or hold their head to avoid injury or maybe need to lift their head to place a pillow under it. So we have this discussion um, where we go through all of the possibilities, understanding what that patient's particular seizures are like and what we may need to do in the event of a seizure, not necessarily uh, expecting that there will be a seizure, but in the event of a seizure so that we know all of the different things that might happen. Another recommendation for a psychologist would be that you do want to ensure that the patient is safe from injuries. And this may sometimes require making necessary modifications um, to the office during the session. Questions to ask yourself, does the session need to be conducted on a carpeted floor, so off the chair and onto the floor? Is there wooden or hard furniture that needs to be moved out of the way? Do you have a pillow that you can perhaps place under the uh, patient's head? And if the patient, for example, scratches, uh, themselves should they use mittens. These are just some examples. I typically begin therapy by teaching uh, a breathing retraining exercise. And I make sure that it's well practiced and learned. Uh, breathing retraining exercises are going to be a key part of uh, therapy and of interventions during uh, an actual seizure. Um, I typically speak to the patient during the episode. It is very rare that the patient is fully unconscious. And uh, typically, there is an alteration of consciousness, but most patients can hear what is being said. Uh, I use this uh, as a grounding uh, technique, where I'm reminding the patient that they are in my office. I'm reminding them who I am. I'm reminding them what we're doing what we were talking about or what we were involved in at that uh, time before the, uh, the uh, seizure occurred. Um, I may repeat to the person that um, we are talking about memories and that uh, we are now in a very different time than when that memory occurred. Depending on how the episode is presenting, I will often, after a minute or two, be able to suggest to the patient that the episode is near its end and we'll begin to focus on breathing. And then once the episode has resolved, typically we will work on processing what happened as soon as it ends. So I think it's very important to know that it's not necessary to stop a session just because of an episode. If the patient can continue, the session should continue important to assess if the patient can continue talking about that particular distressing topic that might have preceded the seizure, or if you should move on to processing and discussing other uh, important topics. Uh, a number of patients have complained to me that uh, sessions are often cut short as soon as they have a seizure, while it is very, very possible that uh, the patient will recover and can continue and in fact, you get a lot of good work uh, done after the seizure. Um, and you also get the chance to show uh, the patient that that particular avoidance mechanism uh, occurred, that they were able to control it, come out of it, and that they can continue to work. 
an important recommendation for a psychologist or any mental health professional would be to not leave the patient alone or allow them to leave the office until they are recovered. What I will often do is, uh, if um, I am at all concerned that a seizure might occur, that it'll be hard for the patient to leave the office, I will ask them to have someone accompany them um, to the appointment and wait in the waiting room. If the patient came by uh, himself or herself, uh, we'll make sure that we have an emergency contact number from the outset that we can call. And the patient will wait until the uh, companion can come. If there's an exam room, the patient can sometimes rest there or remain in a waiting room. And I'll sometimes ask my office staff to monitor um, if I'm with another patient. So, uh, this last point is uh, a very important one. Unless the patient has hurt herself or himself during the episode, for example, fell and hit her head um, or has some sort of other injury, or if the episode is notably different than any other typical episode, or if the patient is not responsive, I typically avoid calling 911. 911 often results in an ambulance uh, being taken to the hospital. Um, there can be a whole series of medical procedures that are uh, performed on the patient that are not necessary. Um, so unless there is something that is different or that concerns me or there has been an injury, um, the attempt to uh, work through the seizure and to then uh, help the patient through the recovery process without calling uh, 911 or an ambulance um, should be the way to go. You know, most seizures are dissociative in nature, so some of the things that I have found helpful uh, are to use grounding techniques, uh, either small bags of ice or a frozen orange that can be held, paddleboard with a little ball. I had a particular patient who was a hula hooper, um, and so as we were doing the session, um, she would use a hula hoop to maintain herself um, concentrated on doing two different things, uh, transferring an object from one hand to another. All of these can be helpful during discussion of intense topics. If you're conducting PE in particular, it can be helpful to do imaginal exposure retelling um, of the memory very quickly, or using um, writing, or using technology. Um, there are some patients who become mute during the episode but are still conscious, and there are some apps uh, that can be used uh, to retell the taped memory, um, and in that way, exposure can continue. So we've finished with uh, most of the presentation. We're just going to go over some of the basic resources um, that are available. And uh, there are some resources that are uh, directly for uh, uh, professionals, and then there are others that are for uh, patients. Uh, we did mention before that in order to help your patient find an epileptologist or an epilepsy center in the US, uh, this is a link. Uh, where you can go and um, look up based on zip codes. This is the American Epilepsy Society uh, link for a find a doctor. Um, sometimes patients have some very um, simple questions about, uh, frequently asked questions about PMES. Um, this is a link uh, for frequently, frequently asked questions. PNES treatment referral sites. This is another link for a total of 15 states are represented in these uh, referral sites uh, here in the US. Uh, I, would love, I would love for there to be a total of 50 um, states represented. Um, so if someone who is listening to this webinar is a uh, mental health pro professional, who is interested in working with PNES, who has experience working with PNES, and who would like to be listed, um, you should contact me. I'm going to provide my email at the end of this presentation. I usually um, do uh, contact and speak with uh, the um, people who are listed uh, on, these, uh, um, on this page. 
um, just to have a better understanding of uh, what sort of work you are doing with PNES and uh, what your approach is and, and so forth. And also so that we can make uh, a connection. And some of the, uh, there are a number of professional resources. I'm just going to mention three. Um, there is a review paper that is hot off the presses. It's not even hot off the presses yet. It, it's still in press. Um, this is something that uh, uh, we worked on uh, with a group of um, uh, researchers and clinicians uh, who specialize in PNES. Um, and it is now in press uh, in the journal Psychosomatics. Um, it is uh, called Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, an updated primer. Um, even though I was a participant in this, I, I do recommend it. Um, and uh, I, I find that um, the work that uh, the whole group did uh, was um, very good in, in presenting um, a uh, overview um, of PNES and uh, a whole uh, series of uh, um, different aspects of PNES as well as treatments and challenges and, and so forth um, and in a summarized uh, format. Uh, there are two books that I would recommend um, for professionals. There's the Therapist Guide, um, CBT Informed Therapy by uh, Kurt LaFrance and his co-author. It's called uh, Treating Non-Epileptic Seizures Therapist Guide. Um, it's from the Treatments That Work uh, series and uh, it's available on uh, Amazon and, and so forth. And the second book that I would recommend is the Gates and Rowland's Non-Epileptic Seizures 3rd uh, Edition. Again, a, an excellent book um, that uh, does a fantastic job of covering all aspects of PNES from a professional perspective. Patient resources. In the last few years, there has been a flurry of books that have come out. Um, they are all fantastic in their own sense. Um, the oldest one is the second one that's listed here, Lowering the Shield, Overcoming Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures. It's by uh, John Doherty. And um, it was, um, he is the husband uh, of a uh, person who lives with PNES. And uh, he wrote the first and uh, really excellent book on uh, what his perspective was uh, as the spouse of someone who has PNES, the struggles that they uh, faced. Um, and he has a lot of recommendations on uh, uh, how to navigate the health system and, and so forth. Um, Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, a Guide is a book that I published uh, in 2014. Um, again, it's a uh, book that is written for patients and, uh, and loved ones. Uh, it has ended up also being read by a number of therapists as well. Um, it uh, goes over uh, what PNES is, um, different treatment modalities, um, provides uh, exercises, although it is not meant to replace uh, formal therapy. Um, but uh, it, it is an introduction, um, definitely, to uh, what the condition is and uh, is meant to educate uh, the patient on um, what resources are out there. Um, more recent books that have just come out, uh, The Color of Seizures, Living with PNES by Kate Taylor and Jeffrey Underwood. Kate Taylor is a person who lives with PNES. Uh, in our own words, stories of those living with learning from and overcoming the challenges of PNES. Um, came out this year as well. Uh, my co-author is Mary Martyros. It was her uh, brainchild uh, to produce this book. Um, it is a compilation of 19 um, testimonials of people living with PNES from across the U.S. and from uh, across uh, different countries. And uh, the most recent book that I've uh, seen is uh, called View from the Floor, Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, A Patient's Perspective by Kate Berger, uh, another beautifully written uh, book um, that would be ideal to recommend for patients. Um, additional resources for patients, continuing education scholarships for adults diagnosed with PNES are offered through the Epilepsy Free Foundation. Although the name of the foundation is Epilepsy Free, it does uh, provide scholarships uh, for patients uh, who are diagnosed with PNES as well. There are also PNES awareness, garment, uh, awareness garments and charms um, in exchange for donations that are available on Epilepsy Free. And uh, I run a Facebook page called Psychological Non-Epileptic Seizures that um, is for patients. Um, basically, uh, it uh, uh, 
is a uh, venue to uh, announce uh, news stories or um, different um, events that are occurring uh, with PNES. Um, there are a number of PNES Facebook pages, um, so I'm not going to list all of them um, because I would probably forget one or two. So I'm going to stop here and just say thank you very much for having attended this webinar, and I hope that I've piqued your interest in this uh, very interesting group of patients and that this information is going to contribute to the um, work that you'll be doing uh, with uh, these patients in the near future. Um, I'm providing my email and uh, I provide my address as well. Um, and I'm always very open to um, speaking with uh, therapists or with um, uh, different providers um, about uh, questions that may have arisen about um, patients that are being treated that have PNES or that are suspected to have PNES. Um, so definitely, if there is a, a question, um, shoot me an email. Um, I'd say that um, you know this is a, uh, a very um, challenging yet very very enriching uh, group of patients, and I hope that. Um, some of what we've talked about today uh, will prove uh, helpful in the work that you do. So thank you very much.